please welcome. <laughs> um, no, actually, the first thing I wanted to announce is that we're doing things a little bit out of order. So if you, you might have been expecting a new Shah, and if so, and you'd like to leave, we won't be offended. Um, he will be speaking at, um, in 35 minutes. After we do, or, or 30 minutes, one, one or the other. Um, so, but in between, we're, we're going to be talking, and we are Sherry Cole and Michael Dorf. Um, um, we, we spoke to you yesterday, or some of you yesterday, about some other topics. So our topic for today is how we can learn um, from other justice movements and how to proceed in, in fulfilling the objectives that we'd like to fulfill as ethical vegans and abolitionists, and etc. Um, now, first, Michael is going to speak about how we can emulate social justice movements that whose goals we share. Um, and then after he does that, I'm going to speak about how we can think about emulating uh, the uh, social justice movements whose goals he and I, Michael and I, do not share, although some of you may, and that's fine. Um, and so that'll be sort of the organizing principle of emulating and, and thinking about um, other movements. So without further ado, here we are, Michael Dorf and Sherry Cohen. Thanks, Sherry. So a bunch of people told me after yesterday that they thought we were pretty funny, so today we're not going to be, so I apologize in advance. Okay, so um, uh, Sherry and I are both law professors, and um, we don't teach the same subjects, but we have some overlap. And we often get students who uh, have either taken Sherry's animal rights class or taken my constitutional law class and want to know uh, how they can use the skills they're learning as uh, neophyte lawyers to advance the cause of the animals. Uh, and so yesterday, uh, Tammy Bryant talked a little bit about how um, one of the best ways is actually not to be uh, doing stuff directly with respect to um, animal welfare or any of that stuff, but to make it easier for vegan businesses to comply with the law, to change the law for vegan businesses. Uh, and we, we agree with that. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we can learn from other social justice movements that had the law as a possible tool in their arsenal. Uh, and it's going to be basically a cautionary tale. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Sherry. So you see here, I'm talking about the path of legal change. And I have here listed four categories of uh, oppression, basically. People have been historically oppressed in this country and in other places on the basis of race, sex, sexual orientation, and species. Um, and uh, the, they continue to be. Uh, but with respect to the first three categories, there has been and continues to be some progress, although it is often uh, two steps forward, one step back. Uh, but I want to go back in time a little bit and suggest that where we are with respect to law in the animal rights movement uh, is somewhere where the law is not especially useful. Now, I could talk about legislation, I could talk about referenda. Uh, because my main area of specialty is constitutional law, I've chosen to talk about cases. And I'm going to just give you a snippet of cases from each of these four uh, categories. And I should say, before I do, with respect to all of them, the law has moved in a positive direction uh, in, with respect to sexual orientation very rapidly, very recently. Um, but, as I said, there's still the work to be done. With respect to species, I think we're at an earlier, early point. So let's take a look at race. So this is a lot of language you can't read uh, because it's too small. Uh, but it's a quotation from a Supreme Court case in 1857 that I'm sure you're all familiar with called Dred Scott against Sanford. The question uh, in the case was whether Dred Scott, who was an enslaved African American, who was taken by his so-called master into a free territory, became free thereby. Uh, and he argued that he did uh, in light of the Missouri Compromise. The Supreme Court said the Missouri Compromise is unconstitutional, uh, and in any event, he could never be free because the Constitution has baked into its DNA the idea of uh, white supremacy. Right? And so that's just language that just says that, basically. Uh, now, that was 1857. It was probably crazy to think in 1857 could end racialized slavery in America by bringing a court case, right? It took a civil war. All right, next example, sex. 
this is a, so the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment adopted in 1868 says no state shall deny to any person uh, the equal protection of the laws. Uh, it says person. Uh, it doesn't say no, no male person, it doesn't say white, no white person. And so Myra Bradwell, who wanted to be a lawyer uh, and was forbidden by the state of Illinois from doing so, sued uh, the state. And her case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, well, come on, equal doesn't mean what you think it means. And there's this, this uh, famous patriarchal language in the majority opinion, right? the paramount destiny and mission of women are to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. This is the law of the creator. What can we do about it? And the rules of civil society must be adapted to the general constitution of things and cannot be based upon exceptional cases. Right? It would take uh, nearly another 50 years until women got the vote. It would take nearly another 100 years until the courts, in response to the women's movement and the sort of first wave feminism, uh, began to change the constitutional law. And as we know, as I said, there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, sexual orientation, right? So as, as many of you know, right, the last decade or so has seen a remarkable change in some of the laws and in social attitudes with respect to social or sexual orientation. And what's, what's encouraging about this, and this is the part of our story that's not a cautionary tale, but an inspirational tale, is how quickly it's happened. Just think back uh, as recently as 11 years ago, in the 2004 presidential election, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, George W. Bush used the fear of same-sex marriage as a cudgel with which to uh, get votes uh, that otherwise might have gone to uh, John Kerry. And there's at least a, good, a plausible argument that that was enough to swing uh, that election. Right? Again, we're still not uh, where we need to be. The Supreme Court will probably find a right to same-sex marriage in a few months, but there's it's still legal in many states to discriminate with respect to employment and all sorts of other things on the basis of sexual orientation. But the ball is now rolling. Now let's talk about species, which is what we're all here to talk about today. So here's a, a case that you may have seen in the news. Um, the, this is a case brought by the Non-Human Rights Project, uh, led by Stephen Wise, in New York State, seeking a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of Tommy, who was a captive chimpanzee, uh, who was held in the sort of miserable conditions that uh, billions of animals are held in uh, all over the world and all over the country. Uh, but the Non-Human Rights Project had a clever idea. They said, well, Tommy, because he's a chimpanzee, is essentially a person, right? That's the key, the right? Non-Human Rights Project. Uh, they don't say in their literature or in the lawsuit that he's a person, as Gary Francione said, in virtue of the fact that he's sentient. They said he's a person in virtue of the fact that he has various capacities that make him a lot like humans. And if you go to the website of the Non-Human Rights Project, Project, which I haven't taken a screenshot of, I'm sorry about that. Uh, they have a picture of a chimpanzee, an elephant, a dolphin, and a, and a gray parrot, right? The, the sort of geniuses of the animal kingdom. And the message of the, of the lawsuit, of course, is that the, these animals are special, they're, they're like him. So one can criticize the Non-Human Rights Project for bringing the suit on one of the bad grounds, but I think that um, the best that can be said for lies in the Non-Human Rights Project is, well, they're going to start with chimps and maybe other great apes and uh, orcas, right? There was a similar lawsuit a couple of years earlier uh, brought by PETA on behalf by Tilikon, who is uh, an orca held by uh, SeaWorld. Um, that is featured uh, subsequently in Blackfish. Um, and the, the idea might be you start with that and you get, you get an opening wedge. So here's what happened though, right? The court said, this is a New York State trial court, uh, said that the writ of habeas corpus, habeas corpus, for those of you who don't know, is simply a piece of paper that says that somebody who is holding a person in unlawful custody has a right to go before a court and have the court judge the lawfulness of the custody. And so this case didn't even get off the ground because the trial judge said chimpanzees can't sue under uh, habeas corpus. It's not like Dred Scott in that regard. He says, you are not a legal person so far as we are concerned. Right? He says, the ascription of rights has historically been connected to the imposition of societal obligations and duties. Right? And chimpanzees can't be given the obligations to serve on juries, uh, to, um, you know, to, to vote, and so forth. Uh, and therefore, of course, well, of course, that's a ridiculous argument, right? That's true of children, that's true of many uh, humans with disabilities, so-called moral patients, but that's the argument. 
Uh, and then, and then uh, in a footnote, the judge wants us to think, well, it's okay, though, because the legislature has extended significant protection to animals, subject to criminal penalties, such as prohibiting the torture or unjustifiable killing of animals. So when I read that, I said, oh, great, because all killing of animals in the United States is essentially unjustifiable, and most of them are being tortured, and so they have a right to that. Terrific, but of course, you read what they mean is uh, animal welfare legislation, uh, and so he said, well, don't worry about it. All right, what lessons uh, do we draw about this? Well, the first thing I think is, it's a mistake to think that you pass a law and then things change. It's not how the law works. The way the law works is people's hearts and minds change, their behavior may change, and then the law plays catch-up. All right, so here's, a, uh, here's the traditional view, right, that, that, that I think motivates a lot of lawyers, right? People do evil because they are ignorant. This is Socrates' view, this is why Socrates Never, never says anything, he just asks people questions. The idea is that they already know the truth, if you can just enlighten them, then they will do the right thing, right? Um, this is attributed uh, to Socrates by a student called Diogenes Laertius. Uh, there is only one good knowledge and only one evil ignorance, right? So people don't do evil because they're evil or because they're bad, making bad choices, they're evil because they don't know the truth. So this idea would say, all you gotta do is go out there and tell people the truth, right? Well, I think that's very important, but I don't think it's enough, right? Um, so the question is then, are people rational or are they rationalizing? And just, just a mountain of psychological data that uh, says that people use their rational faculties to reduce cognitive dissonance. That's sort of what, for those of you who were here for Tammy yesterday, that was her point. Uh, there's all sorts of studies. I've just here uh, uh, given you one. This is a famous study from 1951 in which the, uh, the social scientists showed a football game to groups of students, Princeton students and Dartmouth students. Uh, it was a Dartmouth-Princeton football game. And they asked them how many infractions were, were there there that were not called, how many rules violations, all right? And this table basically shows that the Princeton students thought the Dartmouth team was getting away with murder, and the Dartmouth students thought the Princeton team was getting away with murder. And I'm sure we've all encountered this in all sorts of uh, daily life. Okay, similar data about religious conversion. Uh, people are not, do not, not do not undergo a religious conversion simply because right, they see the light. Right? There, there's a lot of social science research into this, all sorts of social factors about it. One of the most important, it turns out, I think, is having, if you look at the data, is having a community that is supportive with respect to the religious conversion. So to the extent that what we are doing is converting people, and I, I know a lot of people don't like to use that word, I don't like to use that word because I think it puts too much pressure on us, but to the extent that's what we sort of want people to do. Inspiring. Right. They said that we're inspiring people to convert their views. Um, I think this, this information is quite useful. Okay, what are the implications of this cautionary and slightly hopeful tale for activists? I think the first is that you shouldn't expect too much from the courts or from the law more generally. Uh, however, it is occasionally possible to win by losing. So sometimes if you talk to activists in various um, social reform movements, they will have a legal strategy as part of their strategy, right? The idea is you bring a case, you lose, but you generate a lot of publicity for your cause, and that brings people aboard. It's a, it's a mobilizing uh, effect. Uh, there is some argument that this was true of uh, uh, Prop 8 with respect to California, even though it was a, back, it was a backlash proposition, but the backlash didn't change the public attitudes. And there are, there are various other examples of, of this, right, where you can win by losing. But the truth is, usually, you're going to lose by losing. Uh, in the examples I gave you, what those losses did was to either lock in a bad set of arrangements uh, for many, many years, or to precipitate a crisis uh, that uh, the, the outcome of which was not at all certain. Uh, so the question then is, what can we do? And the place I'd like to end and turn it over to Sherry is to ask, well, should we therefore compromise our principles by seeking only what's possible? Uh, this is sort of, you know, the, the smaller cages and so forth, in the hope that, you know, maybe in the long run things change. And the three question marks, I think, should be a spoiler alert that she's probably going to say no. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> it's a mystery. Okay, so thank you, Michael. Um, so, yes, space bar. I, I, um, Gary Francione was earlier um, humble enough to note that he doesn't do a lot of 
PowerPoint presentation, so I'll say that I'm even less experienced than he is, so, so to be, beware of, of this, but I will try my best. All right, so the question for us is when does compromise make sense? Um, sometimes maybe it does, sometimes it doesn't. I think that the view of a majority of people within what we might call the animal protection movement broadly takes the view that compromise and welfareism makes sense uh, for the movement, and this is something that this conference has sort of stood up against and said, no, that's, it doesn't make sense for our movement. But I wanted to explore a little about that and, and, and do so by thinking about the animal rights movement next to a different movement, which is the pro-life movement in abortion. And as I said, it's not a position that Michael and I take, although we have written a book called Beating Hearts, Abortion and Animal Rights, analyzing some of the parallels in terms of strategy, struggle, and, um, and the kinds of, of thinking that, that gets done in the two movements. So the pro-life movements have has some, le 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 has some lessons for us um, about whether we do compromise and incrementalism or clarity and fidelity, and what we might call integrity, within uh, our movement. Uh, Beating Hearts, that's a little reference to the book. And I think that there are three useful ways to think about how a movement faces challenges and when it ought to handle those challenges in some particular ways. So the first is, what is the mainstream view? What is the mainstream view of the thing that your movement takes a different view of? The second is, what is your adversary's philosophy? So you've got the mainstream view of either animals or fetuses. You've got your adversary's view of those two things. And, and then finally, you have the question of the target's receptivity. How receptive is the target of your messaging to what you're trying to say? Okay, so what is the mainstream view about animals? That there is a hierarchy of animals. That some animals are worth more than other animals, right? The non-human rights, the, the non-human uh, rights project. Um, does seem to take that view. I actually had a little bit of an email exchange with um, Stephen Wise because he disagrees on that, but I think that the arguments that are made about the unique capacities of chimpanzees and other animals within the group that the Non-Human Rights Project protects really speaks for itself. It talks about autonomy, it talks about the ability to plan and do various other sorts of things that humans do. And so in a sense, it invokes the specialness of humans as a way of protecting particular, but not necessarily all animals. So primates, elephants, orcas are included in these special groups, gray parrots as well. And then you have dogs and cats, I think for somewhat different reasons. I don't think it's that we think dogs and cats are the geniuses, but that they're our friends. So that we sort of, we like our friends, and we also want to protect the geniuses. So that's the mainstream view that some animals, and you know, people send petitions to me, can you believe that people are eating dogs in this country, and that they're harming horses, I can put those up. Um, people are eating horses, and you know, my reaction is, I can't believe people are eating animals. It's terrible. I agree with you. And of course, then the communication ends. In, in kind of um, so, um, and then the, uh, and then of course the lower-ranked animals are the cows and the pigs and the chickens and the turkeys and the fishes and the fishes. The most amazing thing is when it comes to fishes, and I realize we were supposed to say fish. But fishes is a way of sort of identifying that they are actually individuals that have numbers and that when there are a number of them, that they're, they're not just this mass of stuff. And someone once said to me, you know, in some, in some cultures, actually, fish are vegetables. Um, and I said, it really isn't a cultural artifact. They're animals. That's, you know, simply what, what they, they are. Um, and they're sentient animals. Okay, so that's the mainstream view of animals, that there's a hierarchy of animals. The main, another mainstream on animals is that there are a hierarchy of harms, right? So there's the okay thing to do with them, which is to eat them and to eat their secretions. And then the bad thing is to have them fighting against each other. So like cockfighting, people will be against cockfighting but not um, cock slaughtering. Um, or dog fighting, stuff like that. Bullfight, fighting seems to be bad. You shouldn't fight them, it should be one-sided where you hold a knife and slaughter them. Um, <laughs> And then also there'll be the view that certain kinds of, of, of um, products are bad, like foie gras or fur or veal. Um, I had an exchange with the um, 
one of the justices on the Supreme Court of Israel who had um, ruled, and her majority opinion had ruled that foie gras is impermissible in Israel because it's cruelty to animals, because it's unnecessary and it's a luxury food. And um, we were both in the audience when she was speaking, and it was clear that the audience, the event was, well, wow, these are people who care about animals. And, and, and we said, well, you know, that and chickens are also luxury foods in the sense that they're unnecessary. And she sort of looked shocked because I think most of the audience was just like, oh, you're so great that you're doing anything for animals at all. It's the first country to have recognized anything with respect to an animal cruelty. And she said, well, you're entitled to your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be entitled to my vegan lifestyle. But, um, so, so foie gras, fur, veal, so you see the hierarchy not only of animals but also of, of um, attack injuries on animals. What's the movement view? And I mean by that the abolitionist view of animals is that there are no hierarchies among sentient beings, that we're all equal and in our entitlement not to be utilized and tortured and killed, we're not equal in the sense that we, we all should be, you know, um, voting or doing other things that, that not that non human animals don't really do. And that all uses are equally unnecessary, that foie gras is unnecessary, but so is, you know, Peking duck and so is a hamburger. So there's my blank slide. Um, now, what's the mainstream view of abortion? That there's a hierarchy of embryos and fetuses. That there's a temporal hierarchy in terms of the fetal development. And that over time, the moral status of the entity increases. And that that's the mainstream view. And there's also a hierarchy of reasons for abortion. So, for example, if you're saving a mother's life, or if it's for rape or incest, people are more receptive to thinking that's okay in public opinion polls and so on. Other reasons, like, you know, we can't afford another child or it's interfering with my career or whatever, are considered less important. Um, so that's the, the mainstream view of abortion. Also, that there are a hierarchy of methods. Partial birth is worse than others. That seems to be very, um, it, it's not an actual method, but it corresponds more or less to a, a dilation and extraction abortion where part of the um, fetus is delivered before being killed. Um, okay, so what's the movement view of abortion? The pro-life movement view is that life begins at conception. And that means that all of the different stages are equal that zygotes and embryos and fetuses and newborns, for that matter, are all equally valuable as entities. And so any kind of distinction drawn between them is invalid, much as we would say it's invalid to distinguish between a cow and a dolphin. All methods are also equally objectionable. So both for the pro-life and animal rights movement, they reject the mainstream lines, even though these are the mainstream lines that really the law reflects, right? So uh, dog fighting is illegal everywhere in the United States, and dairy consumption is considered something that has to happen or else your parental credentials are called into question. Um, Late-term abortions are prohibited by law in many places, and early abortions are permissible. So the law, and not surprisingly, embraces these mainstream views in both the context of animal rights and abortion. All right, so what is welfareism? Um, well, we define, I think not controversially in this audience, welfareism as laws and policies and approaches that are inconsistent with the ideology and values of the movement. Um, so we also, we call um, abortion regulations that say things like, oh, you can't use this method, or you can't abort after a certain point, or for this reason, we call that abortion welfareism, even though it's not literally for the welfare of the fetus, or it's not anesthesia for the fetus, but it operates in a similar fashion to how we see abort, um, welfareism operating in the animal rights movement. Um, and so, the, for example, a partial birth abortion, a late-term abortion ban, endorses the timeline, saying that it's worse when it's later along in pregnancy, which is precisely what the pro-life movement at its core rejects, the idea that abortion is different depending on the stage and that the closer you get to birth, the more valuable it is. So the question, does welfareism work? It seems to work better for the pro-life movement. In 1981, about 29, well, I guess you can sort of about, but 29.3 uh, 
uh, women for every 1,000 women of childbearing age had an abortion. In 2005, 19.4 per, that's supposed to say 1,000, <laughs> not 100, um, had, uh, childbearing age had abortion. So you see a, a dramatic reduction. You never know for sure what the cause is, but it could have to do with some of these laws and regulations. So that seems to have been more successful. For animal rights movement, seems less successful. There's con enormous consumption of animal products that continues to this day. You can't turn on the television for five minutes if, it's, if there are ads and not encounter some ad with every animal product you can imagine. Um, there are claims that there, people are eating less meat, um, but it's not clear that they're eating less of other animal products. And so I, 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 think, I think we need to take those claims with some skepticism. And to the extent that they're true, I think maybe they have to do with vegan activism rather than with the welfareism. On the other hand, um, even though we say that the pro-life movement has been successful, the pro-life movement opposes the fertility industry because of pre, if you pre-genetically test and then kill uh, an embryo, then that's considered to be like killing a person. Um, and, and yet, people are pretty um, happy about the fertility industry. It's celebrated all the time, and so it seems that abortion welfareism may have played some role in leaving that alone. But by not pushing this message of the actual um, anti-abortion movement, which is that even a zygote is a, a person. All right, so what's another dimension to think about besides the um, mainstream view? Um, it is another dimension is who is your adversary? So the adversary of the pro-life movement, the pro-choice the pro -choice movement, I wrote, uh, I didn't mean the US like the country, I meant us like Michael and I are in the pro-choice movement. You are. Yeah, we, we are. <laughs> no, that would be the small movement. Um, so, um, and the ideology is, comes down to two things. One is that a woman has sovereignty over her body, and therefore she should make the choices about what happens to her body, including uh, abortion. And then second, that the embryo or the fetus lacks moral status. And that most people who are pro-choice are pro-choice for one reason, the other, or some combination of the two. So abortion welfareism, as I said, in, in the sense of regulations of, of abortion that are not quite on the same page in principle as the movement's view, uh, challenges both of these. If you have any kind of regulation on abortion, you are regulating, you are invading a woman's sovereignty, no matter what kind of, whether it's a late term or method or reason or whatever. Okay. Um, and then any regulation also supports uh, the moral status of the fetus. So abortion welfareism betrays its own principles, but it also effectively challenges the other sides. Um, the animal rights adversary is the animal industry. Animals are here for our use, is their view, but they think animals should be used responsibly. Animal husbandry is basically a version of animal welfare. The animals should be used, but in a kind sort of way. Um, so animal welfareism does not challenge its adversary, unlike abortion welfareism. <coughs> So that's a point for pro-life compromise over animal rights compromise. One last dimension is after the mainstream view, where the two movements are even, after the adversary view, where the pro-life wins, is audience receptivity. So who are the abortion consumers? Each year, about 1.2 to 1.3 million women get abortions. That sounds like a lot of people. 33% um, of women have had an abortion by the age of 45. But only 2% of women each year, and it's rare that you'll find a woman who has three abortions every day. That's an unusual thing. Um, and no men, so far as we know, have had an abortion. So we really have, it's really not comparable to our investment in animal consumption. Typical, typical consumer at least three times a day. Typical consumer eats two pounds of animal products a day. Resistance is enormous. Um, so you're giving up more than an unusual procedure. So what does this tell us? On the adversary challenge, pro-life can afford to be welfareist. On the target resistance, the pro-life can afford to be principal because there isn't that much resistance. So is that depressing? Uh, maybe a little bit. Um, but some of what the pro-lifers do is quite instructive. First of all, they push transparency. They push it with pictures. They do it with the uh, mandatory ultrasounds, which is not something that we would endorse, but again, we're not endorsing the pro-life movement more generally. We're looking to, to it for lessons. 
They also endorse, as they also push free speech, and they empower their dissenters conscience by allowing doctors to opt out of doing abortions, for example, or, or pharmacist participation. Um, in animal rights, we too can demand transparency, for example, by opposing ag gag laws. We too can speak freely by doing vegan education, which we're all learning to do really well. Um, and we too can empower conscience by insisting that there be vegan food in hospitals and prisons and public schools where people don't have choices about what they get to consume. Um, and by placing our products next to their products, as Tammy Bryant was so eloquently talking about yesterday. Um, so our challenges are great. The mainstream view differs from ours very much. Welfareism endorses um, the adversary view, so we don't get much points there, and audience resistance is tremendous. But we do have tools other than welfareism, so let us emulate some of what the pro-lifers do with vegan education, let people know that all of it, all animal use is violent, offer and support vegan alternatives, and we will win because we are right. <laughs>
obligations to the animals, to the fly, you know, that we chase around the house and the, and the animals we don't consume is that they are sentient. So I think at least for the overwhelming majority of abortions, and most of them take place in the very beginning of pregnancy, and more of them in would, I think, in absence of some of the regulations, you're talking about an entry that has yet to acquire the, 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 the sort of framework of sentience that we utilize to extend um, rights to animals. So that's one, one piece of it. I interpret Bob's presence behind me as a kind of physical music of life, as he would say on the radio. So we're going to wrap up.